My name is Erin Muir and I'm a landscape architect, as Will said, and I graduated in 2001. Um, I took a year off after school to travel, and so I have been doing this for 13 years, which feels like a really big number to me. <laughs> um, and I started out, actually, I started with my interest in landscape architecture. Um, I was in art school and I had a summer internship with Dr. Sue Gordon one of my dear friends and mentors. And um, I would say that I, in working at the garden, I, I feel like the plants woke me up and Sue helped me figure out what to do with that. And so I figured out that I could use, um, work with plants and create beautiful places and use my artistic abilities and creative abilities to uh, work with the environment. And uh, it seemed like a perfect fit. And so um, after I, I interned for one uh, summer, in a big firm at Carol Johnson's where Nick works and um, that was an amazing experience and I learned so much um, and I also learned that the big office atmosphere w didn't fit me I felt um, like I needed I always pictured that I'd work in a tiny studio um, and so the big office atmosphere didn't fit me but the place was incredible and the exposure to the projects they were working on were really wonderful it was a really great experience um, so I then moved to um, working for a couple years right out of school with Beckman Wareme Limited and um, again that was a great experience. It was a much smaller firm and I was doing much more hands-on things and I, I actually you know when I graduated firms were not all up on CAD so I learned CAD and taught them CAD there because we learned MicroStation when I was in, at URI. Um, and so that was also a really great experience. But I didn't find my work home until I met Catherine Weaver and um, started working with her. And we started um, together at Common Associates, which is out of Stonington, Connecticut, and then um, started. she started Tupelo Garden Works, and I was kind of her right-hand lady. And um, that was an amazing experience. And I think a lot of thinking about um, how we are, how we can be resilient, sustainable, designers starts with what is resilient and sustainable for us and when I met Catherine and started working with her I realized that that atmosphere and what was created in working with her um, was what was sustainable for me and w allowed me to work from a healthy place and that was a huge gift I remember getting rid of the Monday morning feeling and being like I don't have to have a Monday morning feeling. You know, I can just get up and still look forward to Monday as, you know, almost as much as I do to the weekend. It was an amazing shift. And I vowed that I would never go back to Monday morning feeling. And I have not gone back to Monday morning feeling. There are some days I wish I could have another Sunday, but it's, I don't dread Monday. <laughs> um, and so that was kind of a, a, a a really amazing working experience. With Catherine, we worked on very high-end residential design projects. Um, um, you know, kind of large estates. And I learned so much from, you know, I kind of went in as a, neoph as a neophyte designer and then kind of more and more moved up to where I was really comfortable working directly with clients and um, working on big projects and with big budgets. And it was incredible. Um, and nothing could have torn me away from Catherine but a travel bug. And so in 2008, it did get me, and I decided to move to Portland, Oregon. And um, it was very sad for Catherine and I because to this day, we still try to figure out how to work together more. Um, but it was a really important move for me. I was excited about working on the large projects, the big residential projects. I was really feeling like I was missing the part where I got to do really edgy, sustainable work. Um, the you know. In the larger projects, you can almost sneak sustainability in, but it has to look within a certain context and it can't stink of sustainability. It has to kind of work within. And that's not in all cases. It was the projects that we were working on. Um, and and that was I was finding that hard and I was really yearning for kind of being thrown in the thick of like cutting edge, uh, resilient and sustainable design. So I f And I'd always wanted to live in Portland, Oregon, so I just went there. Um, and initially, um, I worked with Catherine and our plan was to work together and to continue uh, as Tupelo Garden Works. But then it was 2008, which you may not remember as much as 
us who were working, but 2008, or maybe, yeah, it was, it was intense. Um, and so basically the industry bottomed out. And so then I was in a new place and there wasn't work for me and I had to make it happen. And so that's kind of how I started my own firm. Um, Catherine had treated me like a business partner and I really, she really taught me so much that I felt comfortable running my own firm. Um, feeling comfortable and making it happen are two different things. <laughs> and so I then moved to kind of networking like crazy. I had lunch with more people than I could ever imagine. I really got out there and um, eventually I really did create um, an, a successful business there. And so um, I worked as my, for myself for a little while and then I met um, my now husband and um, I joke because we got work married before we got really married. He was, he's an architect and he was practicing on his own and it was clear that we had a real work synergy and um, never did I think I would partner with an architect, but I did. And um, he's a very down to earth landscape um, sensitive architect. And so um, it worked out really well. And so now the Figure Ground Studio and then we moved now we're in the Hudson Valley. So I have been bouncing around a bit, um, but in all of those experience, I have gathered so much valuable information and so many amazing connections. And I continue to stay very connected to Portland because I think that they have a lot to teach us as a place. I think a lot of what's going on there is beyond. And the reason when you, when you live there, I lived there for five years, the culture, the culture is everyone kind of um, is operating from a similar understanding that, you know, um, whoop, I did, uh oh, <laughs> yeah, you have to put your pastor, I can keep talking, um, that, you know, uh, the culture is really amazing there in that everyone is kind of bought into the idea that it is our responsibility to care for our planet and that we have to make steps and do things to do that in our day-to-day -day life. And of course, that's a generalization, obviously not everyone, but the, the popular culture kind of operates on that and it, was, it, it, it affects everything. And so it also affects design and what your clients want and what, and what they're asking for. Um, there's much less client education because, um, because it's just, it's part of what the, the vernacular is. Um, so yeah, so in, in, um, so that's kind of the, the work history and how I got to where I am today. And then the question comes, and as I was thinking of this presentation, I was thinking about, you know, what, what it was my, what was the value of my education at URI? And really, um, URI gave me the tools that I needed to do what I do. And every class that you take is a, part of your tool bag. And I think it's interesting and almost, you know, I'm sure there's many other fields, but in a lot of fields, I think people come out and they're like, okay, I have this degree. Now, what am I going to do? And interestingly, when you come out as a landscape architect, you have skills and that other people don't have. And it, you, it's, even though it's a directed degree, if you like what you do, it's a real gift because you have drawing skills, you have computer skills, you know about plants. I mean, of course, you know, the basic vanilla of all of this. And we were talking at dinner about how um, that's okay and it's important even that when you're going into a, into a new office, the most important thing is that you're like thoughtful, nice, and um, willing to learn and put your time in to become a designer. Um, and so um, in thinking about that, the, one of the skills that I thought about that is um, so important is drawing. And I'm a really big proponent of hand drawing. Um, I do computer drawing. I work in AutoCAD and I work in um, SketchUp and you know all the supporting programs, Photoshop, Illustrator, when need be. But to think and to create and to come up with good ideas, I use my mind and I use my hands. And I, um, I, have, I have a hard time thinking within the frame of the computer and I I, Ethan and I, my husband and I often walk around, we say, you, you can almost pick out the buildings where, where it's like a CAD block that designed the building, you know, instead of the person thinking about what would be the best. And that all, that's a, you know, gets into time and budget and all these things, but it's a really amazing um, to just sit and think with yourself and your hands and no distractions and to be able to draw. Um, it's also really amazing because I work mostly at the residential level. This is a multi-unit um, kind of co-housing um, project in Portland, but this was used as a sales tool for um, the co-housing community. And it was really cutting edge and really modern, but they really wanted a hand drawing to explain and sell the coziness and the 
human scale of their project. Um, and so that was, you know, the concept was we in the mate, we did the concept of then this was just getting paid to draw in color. So awesome. Um, I love it. And so, um, so that's great. And then also it's interesting because this is a quick, um, quick sketch over a SketchUp model. So I, I don't really like plants in SketchUp because they're really, they're just like organic and we try to draw them in SketchUp. And, but if you do this, it takes like 10 minutes and it's like, and the clients love it and it's really easy and you can visualize and it's more alive. And um, so I use, you know, I use hand drawing and I encourage people to, to, to do that as well. Um, and the other great thing is with SketchUp, you don't, I mean, I won't say this because I think it's important to learn perspective, but you don't really need to learn it because it's all right there. Um, and that's the other end of this, this project, um, just kind of showing the two views. And I'm using these mostly to show, show the importance of, of hand drawing. Um, of course, I can do, um, you know, computer drawings. I realize my drawings are pretty pixelated up there. It is what it is. Um, they're not very pixelated here. Um, but anyway, so, you know, I think that computer drawings, when you're doing planting plans or you're doing construction details or there are endless changes or you're collaborating with architects and engineers, there's so many layers that exist and you need to coordinate with that the computer's an amazing tool. And, you know, SketchUp and, um, and AutoCAD, you know, they can be design tools as well once you, you kind of have concepts going and, and you know, they, they work they re work really well and are important. Um, so this brings me to the first project that um, I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to focus mostly on this project. Um, it was in Portland, Oregon. All the work that I'm talking about is in Oregon because I thought that would be fun and exciting. Um, and so it's funny because I did this, I did this hand drawing planting plan, which is um, kind of sketchy. Let's see, can I, how do I make the point? Does it point? Oh, yeah. Um, basically because I didn't feel like working on the computer for one more minute. And when you work for yourself, you get to make those decisions, which is really fun, um, which is that I was like, I just need to get away from my computer. And so the client got a hand drawing of their, um, of their planting plan. And so um, anyway, so this is um, a project in Portland. And it is a single residence home. And it was designed for the Living Building Challenge, um, which is a high kind of uh, green design standard. Um, and it kind of deals with creating a net zero building. Um, and there are parameters for the site pedal as well, including uh, you know, how you deal with water and urban ag um, and other aspects. And you, know, you have to use a certain amount of native plants. Most of your plants have to have some purpose other than just beauty, although beauty is a pedal. Um, the living building is illustrated as um, a flower. And all of the criteria are petals that you reach to get your living building certification. And so um, this project, I also was able to employ um, a lot of permaculture practices. This was a great project for that. And I'll explain why um, hmm, there. Yeah. OK. I'm really sad that it's so pixelated, but it is what it is. OK. So let's see. This is the house. Um, and it was, as I said, designed for net zero water. So um, all of the water comes off of the roof, drains down through the middle, and is collected into a custom-made cistern under the house, under the carport. Um, the amazing thing about this project, stepping back, is that I was at the table with the landscape contractor, with the house contractor, and with the architect from day one. It was amazing to be able to. Uh, to be able to be involved with a project before they even put the house, even know where they're going to put the house on the land or how high they're going to set it. And to be a part of that decision making is so beneficial for a project. And it's um, an amazing thing to be able to, to do. So um, basically, that catches all the rainwater. Um, something that's really neat about this project and also really unique in Portland is gray water reuse is, um, is legal. So gray water is all, and you may know this, but I'll just remind you that gray water is all the water that comes through your house that is not um, your toilet and is not your kitchen sink. Um, and it, in Portland, there were people doing using gray water in their landscape prior to it being legal, um, but it was guerrilla gardening. And so basically, there was an organization called Recode that fought for sustainability recoding in Portland so that things like gray water could be legal. Um, there were restrictions on it and they were actually writing the rules while we did this project. So we did the project kind of without the rules. Um, so we included the kitchen sink. 
um, which the way it was constructed ended up being a mistake. Um, but I will get into that. I'm kind of going to give a little bit of like lessons learned as well. And so as you can see, kind of the water comes down, it goes in, and then it goes to all the appliances. And um, in the drought months, it, um, not in the drought months, in the, in the, when it's raining, it comes down, flows underwater in a really simple gray water system. And I, um, you can kind of, here, here is this. Okay, so this is really bad this way. But I wanted to show this because it's really funny because it, there's so much information on this plan and it's a hand-drawn plan that I had to like put together really quickly for a meeting and the computer wasn't quick enough to get it done. We were meeting with the plumber and we were meeting with the architect and the whole crew, which I have to say meeting with a plumber is not something that always happens at design meetings and it should happen more because we were coming up with a gray water system. Like it's not something that's been done often. Um, there are a couple of resources and so we came up with a system where the water simply comes down and there are these kind of Y-shaped pipes and then it flows down the hill and then there's certain points at which it gets um, cleaned out as it goes along. So um, it was a really, it was really, you can kind of, oh, whoop, whoop. Um, this is an illustration of kind of what happens when the gray water comes out. Um, and this is, an, like, this is like the quick sketch diagram of, of where the gray water was going to go. So the rules were that the gray water could only go to um, irrigate crops, um, but only as drip irrigation. So you can't spray gray water, but you can use it um, to water your garden as long as it's not being, being sprayed. Um, this is a really amazing chart which in shows how much thought is put into designing your cistern. If you're going to be catching your water for the year, how do you design a cistern that accommodates for adults? And what are the systems you use? And to try to figure out that you're going to have enough water if your house is off the grid, how, how do you design to have enough water? And so there's no point in this other than to show you that it's a pretty intense and big calculation to figure out and to get to the bottom of how much water are we, gonna, are we talking about. Um, and so this was my schematic design for the project, um, uh, my, the schematic design to get the people from here to the land. It was a 16% slope, um, and using uh, the idea of kind of permaculture principles where you use the plants, the plants that need the most attention, your annuals, your vegetables, your herbs, those are the closest to your house and in your zone one. Um, and those are the plants that you are going to deal with and pay attention to every day. And so that, this is a vegetable garden um, planters that kind of lead you down gracefully to your little lawn. Um, and again, just in terms of drawing, it's funny because this drawing it took me like five minutes before, you know, and, and, and um, I went to another meeting and showed the architect this drawing for another project and he, he gave me a job based solely on this drawing. And I was like, wow. So you never know what can happen in your, in your, in your busyness. Um, Am I going the right way? This is just um, just to show the site. Um, it was a is a suburban site, and it was a, a double lot that had been had been divided. So it was kind of not virgin land. So it um, and this is the house. The house is passive house, and it is uh, my husband Ethan did not um, design the house. This project was worked on with another architect, um, and so. I don't know how familiar you are with passive house, but passive house basically means you don't need a heating system. Um, the heating system you need takes about the energy of a hair dryer to run. And, um, and the house stays at a constant temperature. The walls are very thickly insulated and there's a um, heat, recovery, heat recovery system that ventilates the air throughout the house. Um, and so this is just some images of that vegetable garden um, once it was was in place and it's it's um it's a little wild and 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 pretty amazing to be there um that she and she uses it and gets a lot of food out of, out of it the top was um herbs and then down coming down are, are more vegetables um and then so coming coming back to once you step down to from your zone one the plants that need the second most amount of attention might be your fruit fruiting trees and shrubs. And so the next layer was um, fruiting trees and shrubs with kind of an underplanted kind of pollinator planting underneath. Um, and this is just an example of those, you know, kind of the fruit trees with pollinator um, plants underneath. And this is an eco lawn. Um, in Portland, there was a company that did, you know, environmentally friendly kind of seed mix mixed with perennials. Um, 
and both really um, helpful in reducing the amount of water use. And this is just the, the perennial gardens that I planted. Um, she was very, she had a bee, uh, beehive, and so she wanted gardens that catered to her bees. Um, and something else interesting in relationship to that is, you know, there was, um, in Portland, they have banned the use of neonicotinoids, but in the rest of the country, it's not, they're not banned yet. And so those are um, pesticides and insecticides that get into the pollinators and actually can end up killing the bees that you're trying to feed. Um, and it was, it was interesting because I only learned that, like really the details of that after doing this garden. Um, and I actually woke up in the middle of the night being like, I, I've designed gardens to kill bees, you know, and, and it turns out that they call, you know, um, Portland has been doing this for a long time. They, they just only now made it a, um, you know, a known thing that they're doing, but the, the nursery that supplied these plants didn't do that. So it's something that's interesting being back on the East Coast and asking these questions to growers. It's actually something that isn't being, I'm finding it's, it's, it's catching on here, but hopefully it will, it will catch on more. And this is just a picture of the hive and the bees and the plants. Um, something else that was really interesting about this project is, uh, so as you step away from the house and you step away from your zone one, which is your immediate need plants, and then your zone two is like maybe your more wild um, you're more like plants that you can pay a little less attention to, but still need to pay attention to. And then there's four and then uh, three, four and five. And they, they go out in succession and five being your wild zone and the zone that you leave and just let it be what it is after you've planted it. And so it's kind of a nod to just letting it be reforest itself. Um, the contractor who I worked on on this project, he is actually uh, working on a project right now called the Billions of Trees Initiative, trying to get people to plant trees for lumber in the managed landscape. Because uh, oftentimes trees are being planted and then they're being wood chipped to where they can be used for lumber. This, tr this project actually was, um, it, we basically planted a little forest. Uh, and it was, pretty, it was a pretty amazing thing to have a client be, be cool with that. Um, the other thing we did is we seeded, and this is this kind of the walk, and you can see it's a little, it's a little more wild, a little, she was okay with the level of wild. Oh, really? <laughs> um, okay, so um, this is just more of those pictures, and I'm just going to, I'm going to go quick because I have five minutes. Um, and so anyway, the lessons learned on that project were, um, don't put the kitchen sink on the gray water. Um, we directed the client, the contractor to do a specific thing with the, with the kitchen sink and then it didn't happen. So it, now her gray water system is actually not working and she has decommissioned it, which is um, a, a failure on, on one level, but it's also a learning on, you know, uh, you, culturally really. Um, and so she's not using her gray water system. It did work for a couple of years, but she decided not to keep doing that. So the lesson learned was, you know, put a grease strap under your kitchen sink. Um, this is, I'll go through this really quickly. Um, a lot of what I try to do when I get, you know, I'm trying to um, ask myself, how do I make this place better for the people? And how do I make this place better for the critters and the pollinators, and how do I connect those two things and not make them at odds with each other? Um, this project was really funny. I was I was um, I was volunteering at a Mustang rescue, and they had an auction, and I auctioned. Oh yeah, I'll do you know I'll do three hours of design consultant, and the person called me, and I put her off and put her off because I was like, I know I'm gonna have to go to this house, and it's gonna be so. And she ended up being one of my favorite clients. This was her house. Um, and we ended up doing an entire planting plan, taking her, her yard that was all lawn, and I'll just go quick to what it was. So this is the before. It's also good to take crooked before pictures, because look. Um, and then this is again more. So what we did is we did um, perennial gardens, and then this front image is a wildflower meadow that we converted. And it took a couple years to convert from um, lawn to a wildflower meadow. It's a stepped process. You can't just do it. It's, it's involved because you have to, you know, kill the weed seed and all of that. So this is just kind of some images of those gardens. I love plants. I, I really care about knowing plants and I dedicate a lot of time to knowing them and I still feel like I have eons to go, but um, I really, I really love um, perennial gardens and what they can do. Um, so those are just some of the images of those gardens. This is a good before and after here. Watch the... <coughs> 
the willow, and then, ah, there's the willow. That's kind of fun. Ah. Um, anyway, <laughs> and then I will stop, I think. This is, this is a before and after of another landscape. This landscape got, um, a cre got um, Audubon certified, um, which is a certification for creating habitat. <laughs> anyway, I will end there. And yes. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, I'm Nick Healy, as Will Green mentioned, the, the male in the group. <laughs> I'd like to thank you all for being here. I'm sure there are other things that you could be doing on a Thursday night. Um, we won't list them, but uh, you'll have plenty of time to do it after we're done, I think. Um, I'm here to talk tonight about uh, a project that we did in the Middle East. Um, but before I get to it, I just want to give you a quick background on my history, my personal history. Um, I'll go all the way back to uh, the early days. Um, I grew up in Maine graduated uh, high school in Maine, and um, that was in 1998, unfortunately dating myself, and moved on to the uncharted territories of landscape architecture at URI. Um, my path wasn't real direct, nor was it romantic. I was actually recruited to play baseball here, and when I was talking to the baseball coach, he asked what I was interested in studying. And at 18 years old, I don't know what, if any of us knew what we wanted to study for or, or practice for the rest of our lives. So I told him I liked to draw, and I told him I liked computers. So he went away for a day, came back, and said, landscape architecture has both of those. And I said, perfect, let's do it. Um, sorry, Will. I know you were hoping for more. It ended up being a great match. I'm still here. Um, so uh, I first heard about CRJA um, when Harry Fuller, the managing principal at our firm, came to one of Will's professional practice classes to, to do a talk. Uh, and I know he hasn't been back for a while, but uh, it ended up being a very inspiring talk. He talked about CRJA's, um, CRJA's cross-section of work and CRJA's firm culture. And just the way he spoke about the people there and the way he talked about how everyone works together, I was just so inspired, I decided that that was the place I had to be. Um, with a little help from Will, uh, making phone calls for me. He made a, co a contact and said, Nick's interested, do you have space? And within six months, um, a space opened up and I started working there. And I just had my 11 year anniversary um, in November. So uh, time goes by very quickly. Uh, if you don't know about CRJ, CRJA is, uh, we're landscape architects and environmental planners based in Boston. And we're right on the Rose Kennedy Greenway. If any of you are familiar with Boston, you know that's the new park system that took place of the awful overhead highway that used to be there, it was <laughs> I-93. And uh, we're, like I said, landscape architects. There are 40 of us in the office. Um, we recently, in 2011, um, did a strategic um, teaming with IBI Group out of Toronto. Um, it was going to help us progress our international and domestic work um, and basically help support our firm uh, in this partnership. So that's, um, we've been partnered with them ever since. So that's enough about me and my history uh, and my journey. This slideshow ends up being a little longer, I think, than it might be allowed. So I'll get straight into it. I'm going to go back to that. Shams Abu Dhabi, a project that we worked on, me and my coworkers, for six years starting back in 2005. And um, for those of you who don't know Abu Dhabi, it is in the United Arab Emirates, which is situated on the Arabian Peninsula, just east of Saudi Arabia, with the Arabian Gulf uh, as its northern border. There are seven emirates in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, Abu Dhabi is the capital. Um, you guys might know or mo know more about Dubai. It's sort of misbehaved sister city. Um, which is about 75 miles away. I made several trips there. There are so many things to see and do. Um, you know, when they spend the amount of money that they have, that's how you get yourself into trouble. And like Aaron mentioned, the, the economic crash of 2008 um, really affected Dubai in a, in a bad way. Um, but that's a whole separate presentation. Uh, Dubai is known for its man-made islands, record-breaking architecture. Kind of drilling down uh, on our project site, the 
Shams Island, which I'm going to discuss, uh, Shams Island, Shams Central Park, which I'll get into uh, in more detail, is situated in a cluster of <coughs> islands called Al Rim. You can see the mainland of Abu Dhabi. And focusing in even more, this is our actual project site. So we're going to go back in time here. 2005, which a lot of you may have been about 12, 11, 12 years old, which is frightening for me. Um, but just to put it in perspective, we were presented with an opportunity to work on a competition design for Shams Central Park in Abu Dhabi, UAE. Uh, we had never worked in this market, uh, sort of a brave new world for us. Um, we wanted to take it on because we felt like getting more international work would be good for the firm. So when we started to research this place, this mythical place, and the project site, this is what we saw, which is essentially a huge sandbar with a mangrove estuary, and for scale purposes, it's roughly the size of downtown Boston. A previously designed master plan of the island was presented to us, um, which, funny enough, the RNL landscape architects out of Denver actually did the master plan. Uh, and then we competed against them for the Central Park Design um, competition. But the master plan involved dividing up the city into five districts. Um, it was planned for 55,000 residents, uh, all mixed use and open spaces, um, with Central Park being the real heart of the project. Something I should note is uh, part of this competition was, sorry, I'll just show you this first. Part of the competition was obviously a cash prize of $50,000, but don't get excited because it cost us 200000 to get through the competition. And also, if we were successful in the competition, we were going to be asked or contracted to do the entire public realm design, meaning canals, walkways, uh, coastal uh, walkways, streetscapes, the whole island. So this was a huge undertaking for us. It wasn't just winning the central park design, but it was the bulk of work that was going to come after it. Um, and so the health that that would bring our firm. We were really disappointed with the master plan. Um, nothing against RNL, but we felt like it was very sort of straightforward, didn't offer a lot of energy. So we went straight to the drawing board, started changing things around, and these early sketches ended up being the backbone of our design. Um, sometimes you do those, they call them thumbnail sketches or a napkin sketch, and sometimes those are the best, sorry, those are the best ideas. Uh, and these happened to carry through our design um, until we were done doing construction documents. So they're really important. I highlight Park Cool because we needed to set ourselves apart from the gang, essentially. We needed the ace in the hole. We needed this design element or concept that was going to set us apart. So we, along with our project engineers from Arup, decided we were going to do this idea of passive cooling. So you might say, what's passive cooling? Passive cooling is essentially using local energies, natural energy. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I've lost track. Uh, in order to, sorry, renewable energy in order to, I'm going to read it. The design approach that focuses on heat gain control, heat dissipation in order to improve thermal comfort. Thermal comfort's the word I was looking for, sorry. I was going to try to dumb that down a little bit. But it's a way of using renewable energy to gain thermal comfort. A thermal comfort, the, the combination of items are listed here. But it's sort of this equation that totally depends on what you're wearing, what the humidity is, um, air temperature, and so on. Now, temperatures in Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and the Emirates in general, in the summertime, average temperature 36 degrees Celsius. That is 97 degrees Fahrenheit. That's average summertime temperature plus humidity. This is acutely uncomfortable when you're outside. That's low temperature. In the middle of the summer, temperatures can go up to 50 degrees Celsius, which is 122 degrees Fahrenheit. It's actually deadly. Sometimes they give warnings to stay inside. For all these reasons, passive cooling seemed like a great idea. Use renewable energy and, you know, maybe more upfront costs by doing this with infrastructure but a, a long-term repayment to, um, to the owner. <coughs> so you see here, uh, utilize renewable resources in the least comfortable times of the year. And the idea was to drop the temperature by 10 degrees in the Central Park landscape. 
some of our strategies that we used um, to achieve this. <coughs> and I'll just go through some of those strategies now. You saw that wind tower on the first screen there, the screen that had text. These have been implemented for thousands of years, these techniques. It's the idea of catching air, catching air at uh, high, high, higher altitude and, dri and driving it down um, to give you the cooling effect, especially when your skin has moisture on it, called evaporative cooling. So here's just a diagram. Uh, another thing that we employed was the idea of pumping cold seawater into Central Park, producing radiant cooling for paved surfaces, and also passing this warm air caught by the wind catchers or wind towers down over cooling coils and pushing that air out into the public space. These are just some quick diagrams. Yeah, that really does go bad, doesn't it? Well, Aaron was right. The graphics get a little bit messed up. Hopefully that's not, hopefully you can see them. Um, you know, we used some of the, we used some of the things that were, that were out of our control, building shade, things like this, um, but we used them to our benefit, along with things that we could control, like ve a vegetation layout, um, planning where we're gonna put trees, making sure we're casting shade on glazed um, storefronts. And then one of my favorite things that actually spoke about Bill Taylor earlier tonight, Bill Taylor came up with this <clears throat> idea, and maybe he learned it from somewhere else. I don't think he invented it. He used to work at our firm, was that we could actually capture prevailing winds and funnel them down to the canal level by strategically placing vegetation and using our bridge overpasses <clears throat> that happen sequentially throughout the site. And that also promotes the evaporative cooling, just that sense of being more comfortable, which I thought was really genius. Okay, here's the trick. I have a little animation that will sum up all the things that I missed there. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm doing this the right way. And I don't know if we have audio. If we don't, I'll try to aim this down, but hopefully you can hear this as well because it's narrated. Can you hear that? Full screen. How do I go full screen? New City greets the dawn over Abu Dhabi, and at its heart is Sham Central Park, a quiet and cool reserve of nature in the city. A system of urban canals can connect Central Park to catch residents and business in Shams. What did we do? Uh, escape. It's okay. I can come Convenient in. underground parking provides visitors with easy access up into the Belvedere, a lavishly screen. appointed paradise garden. Here we go. Escape. Okay, great, thanks. Designed as two levels of Upper Belvedere's and Lower Plaisance, Central Park provides a diverse, sophisticated, and sustainable natural world in the city. Within the park, the traditional Arabian secrets of passive cooling are used to create the world's first passively cooled outdoor park. Beginning below the deep ship channel, cool seawater is drawn out from the sea and used to make fountains and canals flow. Full shade tree canopies and circulating cool canal water under the pavements along the park's shopping galleries can lower temperature 4 to 5 degrees. Conditioned interior air is recycled outside and cool water mists are added to lower temperature an additional 4 to 5 degrees. Across the canals in the Plaisance, cafe pavilions provide the park with shady, sunken courtyards. Heat exchangers in the pavilions turn canal water into cool, dry air to maintain comfort in the cool air pools. 
overlooking the water theater falls and views of Abu Dhabi, a five-star seafood restaurant, and other international dining experiences await park visitors. a sense of the elevation changes that we were going for. Um, we've got sort of upper belvedere's we call them. In the cool evenings, the park will become the most desirable place in the city for families with cool breezes, clean air, and luxuriant nature. After dinner, an evening stroll along the canals leads to events and attractions of Sham's Discovery Center. Galleries of discovery exhibits, shops, and programs are devoted to learning and children's interactive activities. To lift the spirit, improve the health, Inspire the mind and touch the heart. Shams City Central Park. Might as well. <laughs> So that gives you a good idea of the passive cooling technologies that we were shooting for. Um, we did have some other big design elements uh, that we thought were really important. I, start, I started talking about one, but the, the narrator interrupted me. Um, we actually wanted to sink the central part of Central Park, the plaisance. We decided we wanted to sink that down to sort of help activate the edges. When we when you, when you have um, lower spaces, you tend to collect the cooler air in those spaces. So we thought that that was just another good component to the passive cooling idea, as well as all the uh, shade that we have from vegetation in that space. Um, a quick little note is, and I mentioned this tonight, I, I can't remember who I said it to, but the competition was with two different companies, one from Denver, RNL, one from um, Denmark, uh, SLA, uh, I didn't bother to show SLA, but I thought that RNL's information was uh, good enough to show and a good comparison. We were actually asked to re-render our competition plan to look like our competitor's plan in order to win the competition, which I thought was strange. Um, but I'll show you theirs as well, and that's a professional uh, 3D rendering, not done in-house. But this was us, and that's basically a hand rendering, which was the desired media. This is the competitor's which is absolutely beautiful color-wise. Um, whoever's hand drawing that is, um, they're very, very talented. But we found that it was the content of the competitions that um, was, was where we really sort of um, stood out from RNL and SLA. Uh, RNL kept the master plan where the canal goes straight down Central Park. We felt this really segmented the park. Uh, what we wanted to do was stretch it out and have the canal loop the park so that you could activate both edges of retail, uh, and the client loved that. Um, while it was the cool, passive cooling idea that kind of clinched it for us, they liked some of our layout ideas and our ways to activate edges and uh, increase retail opportunities. As I mentioned, by winning the Central Park competition, which I haven't actually said we won it, but we won it, um, we were contracted due to the entire island. Uh, to give you an idea, the island is roughly two square kilometers. Um, there's between five and six miles of coastline. So we did all of the landscape architectural design for all the things you see listed here, including vehicular bridges, pedestrian bridges, uh, along with our engineer uh, teammates. Um, and you can see Central Park pointed out there. This was a huge undertaking for our company. 
um, at any time, half of our company would have been working on this project. And, and like I was mentioning at dinner tonight, we were the prime consultants. So there's that much more coordination that you have to do as a prime consultant. But it really pushes you forward in the group as the leader uh, of the team, which is, which is really good for us and ended up getting us more projects in Abu Dhabi. This is just a breakdown of the districts that we had. I'm not going to spend too much time on these. Um, with the amount of money that was being spent on this project, $80 million just for landscape, um, public landscape and Central Park for construction budget, $80 million. So these are people that have money to spend and they want to see nice graphics. This is a schematic level graphic that we were providing. Full CAD drawings, fully rendered, some of it by hand, some of it by Photoshop. Um, and this was the precedent, which was actually really exciting to work on. Uh, the, the drawing pa packages and working drawings were amazing. That's an example of a section sheet. So in 2008, we had already been over there for a year. My colleague and friend, Chris, had been moved over. He was spearheading Shams. We were starting to get more work, and he needed help on Shams. My office said, do you want to go? I said, yes, and made the trip 12 and a half hours on a plane, which is a long ways away. Um, I want to just summarize the public landscape stuff. How much time do we have, Will? Maybe not enough. Seven it's a four minute animation. I think it's worth it because it, it summarizes the entire design. Thanks. seem to want to play it. Hmm. First century and previews the future of the Abu Dhabi waterfront. Some of the narration is Designed a little cheesy, to provide but all its residents with extensive me. public green open space opportunities. The morning walk affords continuous access around the coastal walk. Whether a day at the beach or a fast bike ride around the island. Living on Shams has wide possibilities for health and leisure with green shaded public connections to all destinations. The Mangrove Walk is designed to celebrate man and nature and the rejuvenation of the mangroves that is taking place all along the west coast of Shams. Living on Shams means engaging with the nature of Abu Dhabi, a city of islands teeming with estuary life and beauty. Every day, residents and visitors can enjoy the life of the mangroves along the boardwalks and view platforms while kayakers paddle offshore. From the water, Shams Coast has been designed to fulfill the green city vision of its builders from the coastal walkways where children play in shady playgrounds. contrast to the open coastal walks is the marina basin, providing full services and quiet waters behind the breakwater. Residents of Shams have a range of opportunities on the marina, from private boat access and public transit to evening destination venues that open out to the colorful activity of Shams Harbor. Imagine a city free of rush hour congestion and the noise of through traffic, where only local service and commuting makes its way along shaded boulevards. The traveler will enjoy the distinctive characters of each street and neighborhood where subtle variation in the design of planting and street appearance identifies each of the five Shams districts. Coursing throughout the interior districts of the new city are 3.5 kilometers of canals, bays, and water loops. On either side of the canals are active neighborhood shopping walks and small parks to provide over 7 kilometers of continuous green connecting open spaces. Every bridge, walkway, and canal has been planned to maximize the public's enjoyment of their home outside their residence, the public open space. Vending carts, under bridges, cafe and restroom facilities, convenient stairs, 
provide universal access to every facility. Interior to the coastal walks and canal walk system is the linear park open space corridor. This system of greenways and small parks will complement the city's open space by providing safe walks from home to school and shops without the interference of traffic. At the center of the public space in Shams is the hub of the city, Central Park. Sunken and shaded, this park is designed to be the first passively cooled park on the Gulf Coast. When the sun sets over Abu Dhabi in the west, our public open spaces will be there to awaken community spirit, enhance health, sharpen the intellect, and celebrate the nature of a city designed for man and nature of the 21st century. So, how does it look 10 years later? Well, one of the reasons I wanted to come here tonight and talk about this project was that I was very young when I started working on this project, and it was very exciting. Uh, you know, there was no expense spared. Uh, so you can get really geared up on a project like that and be very excited to see what it's going to turn out like. So we remember our 2005, um, what, what would be Shams, and here it is today. Nothing's happened. I mean, we've got a minimal amount of development. The Sun and Sky Tower, which are two icons in Abu Dhabi and considered part of Central uh, Shams, uh, have been built and are being lived in. But for the most part, 95% of our island um, is being unused. And there are a few third-party developments that have gone up, but it, uh, it's pretty barren and it's a disappointment. I mean, but it's one of those things that you have to understand. You can work, put blood, sweat, and tears into a project and it may never come to fruition, but it's the experience that you have while you're doing it and the things you learn while you're doing it um, that end up being the most important. These are just a few construction photos. Am I still okay? A couple minutes? Yeah. Uh, forgive the shirt. That's me on the left, and that's my colleague Chris on the right. Um, he had been there a year before I got there. That's the sun and sky tower in the background being constructed. Gives you a good idea of what our canals and bridges look like, bridge construction, and that's our marina wall. Central Park Bridge was completed just before I left in July of 2010, which actually came out pretty nice. Um, some of the craftsmanship there is dodgy, to say the least, so when you get a nice product, uh, you really need to enjoy it. And then I found this picture online. This is essentially what we're looking at in 2015. Um, you know, lots of plots undeveloped, but you can see beach is ready to be developed, uh, basically big pits dug for third party developers. This is the actual lagoon canal at the bottom of Central Park, so we're floating over the bottom half of Central Park. There's our bridge on the left. Um, so it's just sitting waiting for the next big boom, which I think we're working up to. Now if I have one more minute, I'll show you some quick pictures of the fun that I had there. Um, not all the fun I had there, but some of it. And I'll go through these very quickly. Uh, some of the sites I got to see, some of the places I got to go. I did get to do a lot of traveling. When you're in the middle of the world like that, you have so much more access to places. So that was a real benefit to being there. That's Sheikh Zayed Mosque in Abu Dhabi. Burj Khalifa, which I just couldn't get enough of. I, I just couldn't believe this building. It's 2,700 feet tall, twice the size of the World Trade Centers in New York. Uh, it's just unbelievable to see that in person. Got a chance to go up in, onto the viewing deck as well, which is nauseating. Atlantis, the palm. Uh, this is out at the end of the man-made Palm Island. Um, so that, that's a pretty cool place to visit. And then I got a chance to go to the inaugural Formula One race in Abu Dhabi, um, which was the loudest thing I've ever heard in my life. But it was really cool. Got to see some of the new architecture. That's actually a hotel. The cars race underneath the hotel. Uh, which is really cool. And then I thought I could be a race car driver. So I went to Formula 3 and found out at the end of the day that I was actually a terrible driver and very slow. So I had to put that career on the shelf. And then some of the things more culturally uh, significant to do is to go out into the desert and dune bash, which is basically taking a four-wheel drive truck 
and nearly losing your life multiple times. And then they feed you food at a traditional campsite. And that's my girlfriend then and now wife, Anna. Uh, we met there in 2008. And that's Emirates Palace, which is the most opulent place I've ever been in. Um, clubs, they do uh, concerts there. It's a really incredible place. And that's the end of the show. Thanks. I'd also like to thank Erin for sharing her project because I think while you can look at a big project and be overwhelmed or impressed, it's the small projects that build up to these you know, big, amazing projects. It's all the details. It's the third party developments, like something Erin would do more on the scale of Erin's work, that make a place a place. So I thank you for sharing yours too. So there's time for some questions. I hope that some of you are going to ask good questions. Uh, so this is a question for both of you, I guess. Um, both of you have traveled quite a bit, moved around quite a bit. Uh, how does that affect the way that you design on a day-to-day -day basis? Go for it. I'll okay. follow. <laughs> um, I would say that it mostly, um, most of the work that I've done I've been in the place that I've been designing for. So there's a, a learning curve, I think, to understand a place and then design f with a understanding of the systems and the environment that you're in. And so in starting in Rhode Island was easy because it's where I'm from. But going to Portland, I had a really big learning curve just to understand the native plants and the, the rocks and the animals and, the, you know, just all everything that's there. Um, and then even in New York, which is still only three hours away, it's a new, it's a new landscape. So, um, but then all those things really help to inform what, it kind of helps you break out of what you know, you know. So it's, it helps, the vernacular of other places can help to inform your design here or wherever you are. Yeah, I would follow that with um, understanding planting, like you were saying. For in this case, when we're traveling across seas, going into new cultures with new religions and new, I'll call them standards, but uh, you know, they have ways that they do things. They have ways that they angle things. There are things that you're not supposed to block. And so those are the things we had to learn um, you know, when, you're, when you're crossing international waters and going into a new part of the world um, to develop. You just have to be sensitive to culture, like you have to be sensitive to local environments with plants. Um, so I'd say that those are the big things. I have a quick question for you, Nick. Yeah. Um, what program did you use to design that entire thing? Every program that's available. <laughs> <laughs> Save Revit. Re we didn't have Revit back then. I don't know if Revit was a thing in 2005, you know, to eight. Uh, we used everything. We used, obviously, hand sketching, which was, like I said, and we talked about this a lot tonight, is so important to be able to do. I know that there's an angle now that, you know, computer graphics, CAD, Revit, or whatever, are a quick way to do things, and they're real, kind of in real time. But to be able to sketch things is really important. So, but to get to your question, for everything from hand graphics to CAD to Photoshop InDesign, we had to build reports. Um, I mean, we were doing narrations. Uh, it, this, this project was the biggest project our company has ever had. So we literally had to pull everything we had out of the bag. Um, we had control over the design of everything. When it came to like bridges, um, vehicular bridges, we designed what the columns were going to look like. And then our partners from Arup actually designed, did the actual structural engineering. Yeah. So it it is designed to be off the grid within the city limits, but in order to build in Portland they had to connect to the city power and to the I mean to they had to connect not to the power, to the sewer lines. And so they had to have the option to connect in, but it's sol solar panel um, and um, 
it's, it's so solar energy pretty much powers the entire thing. Everything is low energy. Um, the heating system is so minimal in terms of what it requires. The water is filtered with the UV um, system, a Clivus Meltrum system below. All the toilets are um, composting toilets. Um, and in terms of the statistics of the, or the, the, like the numbers of the design of the house, I can't answer now. Maybe a couple years ago I could have, but it's not, that it's not, it, I don't have that available right now. The architect would, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so it's, it, she was able to sustain herself off the grid, um, but she had to have the option to connect back in. I knew, I knew someone would ask it. That we, we didn't do the animations. Those were out of house. What we did was we narrated them. Not That wasn't my voice or anything, but we, script, <laughs> we scripted them. And we did basically all the production that was needed for them. We provided everything they needed in terms of our plans, details, all that stuff. Um, and we uh, produced it for the most part. We sat down with these people, went through it, made all the changes. But we don't have that kind of software. Um, it was a company called Neoscape, which, which do amazing uh, 3D rendering and animations. Um, and I think they're still based out of Boston, but I have to give them credit. They did come out really nice. Some of the narration was a little bit cheesy, but we can blame ourselves for that. <laughs> it, so, with, with the 3D drive through was that, did you create a physical model, or is this all modeled Drawing. Yes, to both. We actually did create a physical model, but that was as a separate submittal. Like we did a full scale, I want to say it was four times the size of that table up there. Ooh, that's fine. Physical model. Again, we didn't build that model, but we supplied all the drawings. The model was built in China. You know, th we had to literally pull all punches for this job. Um, so, no, we didn't build the model. We and we didn't do the 3D graphics. We were just in control of where the fly-through was happening and for supplying all of the, f the backup files to build the actual animation. The fly-through came through drawing as opposed to through model? The fly-through fly came th from a drawing? Well, you, mean, you mean like we, we dictated it on a piece of paper well, and I've, said... I've seen cameras there on tracks, and you, drive, you push the camera through the, the, the physical model. Oh, okay, okay. That it was all computer generated. The fly through was part of the three D animation. Uh, in front and then in back. Uh, those videos are they like available to view online anywhere or anything like that? I'm pretty sure that both of these, or at least that final one of the entire project, is on YouTube. Um, I have business cards with me, so if you really want to see it, I can give you a business card and you can email me. And one way or the other, I could get it to you to look at. It's not, it's not like private or anything. Um, it's a huge file, though. <laughs> so bring a truck, because it's, <laughs> it's big. And then back there? How long is it going to take for the entire island to be developed? That's the answer that I don't have. Um, you know, the economy is the biggest issue. Uh, Aaron mentioned the, the economy turned down in 2008. Well, that was felt in many places in the world. We thought we were protected in Abu Dhabi. But we felt it there, too. And as you saw, it's developed by like 5% at this point. So it really depends on what the economy is doing. Third-party developers have to buy those individual plots, build their buildings, do their landscape. And we're not, they're not going to do the actual public realm landscape that we designed until they start to get some infill, because they want people to be there to use the spaces. That central park is completely useless unless they have a certain number of residents that live on the island. Yep. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest that on? Um, the largest projects I've worked on budget wise were when I was with Catherine. Um, and so those scale wise, scale -wise in terms of acreage. Yeah. Um, I would say like the like estates in Newport running at like four to eight acres. 
um, depending. Um, those were our, those were the biggest projects that you know in terms of built landscapes where millions of dollars were being spent on the landscape and those private residences. Right. So. Any other questions? What do I have to do to get into your office? Yeah. Oh, good yeah. question. How would you compare the attitude in the UAE to that of the United States in regards to the environment, and not the environment in terms of human um, comfort, but an actual, uh, you know, yeah. is there any view on ecology or other living organisms? Is there any? Uh, they've got a ways to go. They, you know, I think they want to be interested, but the, when I was there anyway, the goal is to build big, build fast, and figure everything else out after. When I was there, they started to sort of change that frame of mind, developed a set of guidelines called Estadama, which is most easily compared to our LEED certification. So they're starting to see that they can't just keep bashing the environment and expect, uh, you know, a good turnout, and that they have to start being more sensitive to the way that they're building um, in, in the local ecology. And I, I honestly don't have any sort of updated information on that, but I think that it was headed in the right direction 